I'm Elizabeth Powers. I'm, um, I'm an attorney, intellectual property attorney, do patents and trademarks and, and so forth. I've worked with Foresight, how many years ago was that, Chris? I don't know, it was like in the, in the early 90s. Um, we were talking about intellectual property protection for nanotechnology. And um, I also teach uh, business law, and I, te I teach at Santa Clara, so I teach business law, and I've taught um, in the area of corporations. And when um, Chris and Peter asked if I would talk about corporate law and, and corporate corporations as, general, as artificial general intelligence, my mind kind of went, what? Corporations are legal? That's like legal. And artificial intelligence, that's like science. And so I don't get how they go together. Having read Peter's paper and thought about it for a while, um, I thought that it made sense to kind of give some background definitions about corporations. Um, rarely are attorneys brought in to clarify things, so I'm really enthused that people thought that I could clarify the definitions of things at this conference. So um, I want to talk about corporations because when Peter starts talking about corporations and when Allison is talking about corporations as um, artificial general, general intelligence entities, um, what does that really mean? Because we think about um, corporations as being um, creations of the state, creations of the uh, kind of constructs of law. And um, they promised that I didn't have to do a PowerPoint, so I didn't. I have my notes here instead. So I wanted to go over the different types of business entities that exist so that we can be clear when we're talking about corporations, what are we talking about? Okay, so we'll start kind of at the, how many of you have worked for a business entity of some type or another? See, okay, so you've all encountered business entities. And so hopefully I wasn't alone when you saw the title and said corporations as general artificial, artificial general intelligence um, in saying what's the correlation, what does that mean? So the first type we have are sole proprietorships. And sole proprietorships have no legal standing um, a, apart from the owner, as you probably know. You have the owner, and for tax reasons and legal reasons, sole proprietorships are, are treated as though it's just an individual, and they're not given a separate legal um, standing or entity apart from the construct of somebody trying to make some money in some way, and they have to pay taxes on that. Okay, so moving from sole proprietorship to partnerships, now we have the concept of let's share liability. And the concept of liability is very interesting when we're looking at business entities because I think it ties into this conversation. Liability, ethics, morality, what are the obligations that business entities have generally? So, so, so uh, partnerships are a way for individuals to share that liability to a certain extent with others, with other partners. Now, you could have a shared liability with your other general partner. You can have someone who just is partly a partner but doesn't share in the liability. That would be a limited partnership. But it's, it's a construct, it's a legal construct that's recognized by the states. It's not created by the states, it's created by individuals. It's generally governed by the laws of the various states, um, but it's, an, it's an, a relationship that was established by individuals. That partnership is in fact given the status, a legal status of being a separate entity. It has um, an existence apart from the partners, and so it can fall into this discussion that we talk about corporations as um, artificial general intelligence or, or artificial entities because it is a, con a legal construct. Um, the, main, the main issue goes to uh, spreading out the, the liability. Um, and then the third type of general entity is in fact called corporations. And there's different types of corporations. There's C corporations and S corporations and limited liability corporations. But the whole concept there is, again, to spread that liability out, or as some may say, dodge that liability in a different way. So we've created this legal construct under which en individuals, natural persons, can act, and they have some protection from the, the consequences of their actions. Um, there are obviously ways, and Peter's gonna talk about this, where you can pierce the corporate veil, where you can reach the individuals apart from the entity, but generally corporations are given that legal status of being an entity. Now where this gets interesting is we have natural persons, we have um, legal persons and legal entities, and um, there is a recent case that most of you are familiar with, and again, I think Peter might talk about this, um, is a Citizens United case, which was a 
Supreme Court case. And one of the issues that they talked about in that case was about personhood. The, um, the existence of a corporation as a person apart from the individual actors and what its role is in society. The Supreme Court in the past had carved out um, or had attributed certain constitutional rights to corporations as legal entities, due process, for example. They've carved out other constitutional rights and said this doesn't apply to you, the um, um, Privileges and Immunities Clause of the Constitution, for example. So there are times when uh, corporations will be treated as legal entities, entities that are equivalent to natural persons, you and I, um, and there are times when it's not. Um, in the Supreme Court case, the Citizens United case, they did find that the corporation is just like a person for purposes of um, campaign contributions. They said, look, if you're a wealthy individual, you're going to be donating your money to a political campaign. We don't see that corporations are any different. It's made up of a collection of individuals, and they act as a united front in donating money, and we think that's okay. The dissenting opinion made the distinction, which I thought was a lot more compelling, but maybe that's just my bias, and it said, look, corporations don't vote. They don't um, run for office. So they're very different from a natural person. And so why would we allow a corporation to act in a way that, that is inconsistent with their participation otherwise in the political process? So we can see that the definition of corporations and how they're treated in our society differs depending on um, the situation. Um, which is you know, one of the, the lawyer's favorite responses to any question, which is, um, it depends. Is it a corporate entity? Is it a legal entity? It depends. It depends on what the environment is. So um, Peter is going to be addressing a lot of that. One of the other things I thought would be interesting, kind of as a background to um, uh, uh, the discussion this afternoon when we're talking about corporations and AI, again, kind of in the context of liability, in the context of ethics, morality, what corporations should and shouldn't do, what they can and can't do. Um, I thought I'd kind of give, break down what do we talk, what are corporations? What does that mean? It's a collection of individuals, right? So we have shareholders who are individuals, and the shareholders um, pay money into the corporation so that they have a say in what the corporation does, and they do. Um, the shareholders vote on the board of directors, so they have a board of directors that stands between the uh, shareholders and what the corporation actually does. And then you have the board of directors that actually appoints the different managers, the vice president, the people who are actually running the corporation. And then within those managers, within that C below that C-suite, you have the employees, the other employees who are making things happen. So when we talk about a corporation, um, and we talk about the corporation as an independent entity, we have to keep in mind, and I think this complicates the issue somewhat, but we have to keep in mind that a corporate corporation is a collection of individuals. And granted, the shareholders may not represent um, a true slice of America in the same way that maybe our political process is intended to represent a slice of America. It's still shareholders, could be you and I, if we have investment in a mutual fund, if we buy shares in a company, we're shareholders, and we have some say in what our corporation does that we're investing in by virtue of who we vote in as a board of direct as a director, and the board of director then appoints the um, the officers below. So. Um, Let's see, that being said, I wanted to point out that the directors and officers of corporations have some obligations to the corporation. Um, and that includes a fiduciary duty. So that fiduciary duty is that they're acting on behalf of the corporation at all times when they're an agent of that corporation or the beneficiary. They have a duty of loyalty with respect to their actions vis-a-vis -vis the corporation, a duty of due care. I have to be careful. I have to make sure that what I do is not going to harm the corporation. And finally, the actions of, of directors and officers is viewed in light of um, the business judgment rule, which says we're not going to challenge what you do as a director and officer 
unless it's completely unreasonable. We're gonna give you the benefit of the doubt that you have satisfied your duty of care to the corporation and that the decisions you make are consistent with those duties that you have as long as it satisfies this business judgment rule. Is it a reasonable decision that you've made? So there is some um, level of accountability that um, the, the directors and officers have to the company. That said, it kind of begs the question of, and I think Peter's gonna address this, what is the obligation that a corporation has to society as a whole? Because all those duties flow between the directors and officers within the corporate structure, within that legal entity, but it's unclear what that um, obligation is to society as a whole. And back in the 1800s, when corporations and companies were abusing their workers, um, uh, the, the, the government came to a revelation that, that some regulation was required to keep corporations acting consistent with what we would expect individuals to do in a reasonable and uh, non-negligent way towards their employees. So regulate, regulatory schemes came into play and I'm sure that um, some of the other speakers will be talking about this later, but why we have regulations. But just know that there are regulatory schemes both at the federal level with the Security Exchange Commission, the Dodd-Frank, and, and other regulations have been put into place. But also within each industry in which the corporation is acting, there are sets of regulations that are intended to keep those corporate actions in check and make sure that the corporate actions are consistent with what their expectations are within the society in which they're operating. So um, let's see, what else did I want to say? I think that's it. That's all I wanted to say. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of background um, into what the, the, the terminology that we're going to be using for the rest of the afternoon and particularly with respect to Peter's uh, talk. And I'd be happy to talk to anyone later. All right. Thank you.